A lot of aspiring analysts these days do understand the technical fundamentals when it comes to data cleaning. But one way to really stand out as an aspiring analyst is to actually understand how data cleaning fits into the day-to-day -day job. You might also get tested on this in interviews where hiring managers not only want to know a bit about the how for how you implemented each of the data cleaning steps, but they also want to understand your reasoning and the why behind your thought process. That means that to gain real confidence in data cleaning, you should not only learn just the technical steps, but also have a high level framework so that you can onboard yourself and clean any data set across a variety of different industries. So in this video, I want to show you the high level thought process for data cleaning and also answer questions like, how do I know when I'm actually done? What do I do if I can't actually fix all the issues? And also how does data cleaning actually occur on the day-to-day -day job? If you're new here, I'm Christine. And in this channel, I share the job hunt strategies, mindset tips, and analytical frameworks to help my students in my mentorship program called the Analytics Accelerator land their first data job in three months or less. One key principle to keep in mind is that for any new analytics skill you're learning, it's always important to really understand the business context in which it's being applied. So in this case, where does data cleaning actually fit into the day to day? I'm going to keep things super high level and just give you a bird's eye perspective of what the analytics lifecycle looks like for a project. Usually an analyst will get together with a stakeholder. They'll have a meeting where they discuss the business problem and the questions, and then they'll go through what we call requirements gathering, where we talk about the timelines and the deliverables and the outputs that we're looking for. And then the analyst will either go back on their own and work independently or with other technical people and start gathering and preparing the data and also building analysis and visualizations in tools like Excel, SQL, Tableau, and Power BI. Then from there, depending on what the analyst finds, they'll go and communicate those findings and insights to the stakeholder and they'll decide together what the next step should be and either decide to iterate on that process and go back to the analysis and maybe redo or update some things or move on to the next stage. So data cleaning is most applicable in the early stages of the preparation step, but sometimes it's not always super cut and dry. We might actually do some initial data cleaning, move forward with the analysis, and then throughout that analysis, find that there are more data challenges that need to be resolved, and then go back and fix those as well. So it's an iterative process, which can make it seem never ending. But good data analysts aren't daunted by this because they actually have a mental framework for how to go about the cleaning process. Let's say you're working as a data analyst at an e-commerce company and you're working with the head of operations, Steph, to prepare some insights for the next company town hall. She says, hi, data team. The leadership team is preparing for the company-wide town hall next month and would like to present a historical review of sales trends. Can you help us look into the following? What were the key trends in sales in the last four years? What were our monthly and yearly growth rates? What were trends in refund rates and delivery times? I'll set a meeting next week to review your findings. Looking forward to discussing. So this is pretty representative of some questions you might get asked from stakeholders the first year on the job. And if you know how to actually think like a data analyst, you can feel more confident about what your next step should be. One acronym that you can think of to get you started is actually CLEAN which stands for conceptualize, locate solvable issues, evaluate unsolvable issues, augment and improve the data set, and then note and document. So I think a common mistake of aspiring analysts is to just dive right into trying to fix the data set without first really understanding what it represents. This results in falling down a rabbit hole of trying to fix everything and not really knowing when to move on because you're not really sure what to prioritize. For this ask, let's pretend that we have a sales data set in our data warehouse that looks something like this. Before we get to the technical stuff, we should actually do three things. First is to identify the grain, the measures, and the dimensions of the data set. Second is to identify the critical versus non-critical columns. And then third is to understand the actual definitions of the critical columns. So oftentimes at work, we'd have documentation or a data dictionary, or at least another team member who we could ask questions to. If we're working on portfolio projects, obviously we'd probably be doing this solo, but in both cases, there's a few things that we want to ask ourselves before we move on to the next steps. With identifying the grain, the measures, and the dimensions, first you want to make sure that you understand what each row in the dataset actually represents, that's the grain. And you also want to be able to identify the quantitative values or the measures, because for these values, it's going to be really important to have proper number formatting so you can do actual calculations. And then for dimensions or qualitative values, for those you need to really make sure that each of the values is spelled correctly, that's consolidated and categorized correctly, which I'll talk about in a little bit for proper segmentation. And then given this, which columns actually need to be high quality, aka let's say more than 80% needs to be complete or accurate because it's really essential to the analysis. This way, really big data sets become less unwieldy because you've essentially identified a smaller subset of what you actually care about. 
Then for each of the columns that you've identified as important, what are the actual definitions of each of these columns? So for example, for our data set, what do each of these four date columns actually mean? How are they different from each other? What are the logical rules that we should expect for how these date columns actually relate to each other? And for the USD price and the local price, what was the date of the conversion rate? And for things like product name or product ID, does each product have a unique ID? Now, in the beginning, you might not actually have the full intuition for the kinds of questions you should be asking of your data set, and that's fine. Just make sure that you can actually explain the meaning of each of your important columns in plain language before you dive into the cleaning process. As a benchmark, I recommend spending 30 minutes to an hour on this step if you're just getting used to it in the beginning. By the end of this step, you should be able to say something like, this data set represents sales data where every single record represents a transaction. The most important columns are the sales columns and the date columns. And there's also supplementary information about the product, customer demographics, and marketing information. The data spans from 2019 to 2024. Now that we have more confidence in what this data set actually means, we're better equipped to deal with the issues that we might find along the way. Some data quality issues are immediately solvable, while others fall into an unsolvable bucket. For the first bucket, there's usually three main categories, formatting, consistency, and duplicates. For consistency, you wanna look for things like spelling and spacing differences. So these three different ways of spelling radiant glow vitamin C, and also categorization consistency. For example, spelling it as USA versus USA versus United States of America or United States. And then for formatting, the most common issues are having inconsistent number formats and date formats, or having a column saved as the wrong data tag. And then duplicates, of course, refers to having rows erroneously repeated, which therefore skews the data in a certain direction. You can go about finding these kinds of issues through a multitude of different ways. One is first just by eyeballing the data just to get a little bit more comfortable. You can also use pivot tables, group buys, and window functions to start to piece together your understanding of what the different values are and their counts so that you can also identify duplicates. At this stage, don't get too stuck on what is the actual best method of going about it. Just understand one or two key methods for identifying and solving these kinds of issues. There's already a lot of information about how to actually do the technical side of this on YouTube, so I'll leave that stuff for another video. If you're wondering when is it actually good enough, you can usually just prioritize the columns that you identified as those critical columns at first, and then move forward with the analysis. The most important thing here is not to find every single issue and end up with a perfect data set. It's actually just to make the most critical columns usable so that you can move forward and start diving into the insights. Remember, you can always circle back to this process and clean the data even more if you need to. However, do not overwrite the data if you're working in Excel or Python. Make sure you always have a raw version of the data saved so that you can go back to it if you ever need to. Usually in SQL at Word, we wouldn't even have the permissions to overwrite a table, so there's a little bit less of a risk there. But if you're working in a SQL database like BigQuery on your own, also be wary of accidentally overriding your own data. Oftentimes there are challenges with data that can't be immediately resolved. These unsolvable challenges usually fall into two different categories. The first is of course missing data, where you just have blanks or missing values and you're not really sure why. The second bucket is a little bit trickier to find because this is nonsensical data, which just means the values don't make logical sense. For example, having the sales date after the refund date or having an account creation method that just doesn't look legit or having a country code that doesn't even exist. And this is where I see a lot of people get stuck, especially when it comes to working with really large data sets. If you don't have an engineering team or another person to ask questions to, usually what I see really good data analysts do is they actually first benchmark the severity of the issue. That means they calculate the percent or the magnitude of affected data. So then that makes you understand how much you actually need to care about this issue. If more than 70% of a critical column is missing or nonsensical, it's probably not usable. You're gonna to have to find some other source or not use it at all. If a small chunk, or let's say even less than 10% of the data is missing or nonsensical, maybe you can just leave it as is and then caveat it later in your analysis, which I'll talk about later on. If it's somewhere in the middle, this is where you need to exercise a little bit of judgment in combination with your own domain knowledge and your understanding of what's feasible for this analysis. You usually have a few options here. One, you can also leave the data as is and just see the nulls in the actual analysis or surface the nonsensical values and just flag them as a separate category. You can also impute them with something like a mean or find another data source that can be referred to to fill those values in. Then you can also, of course, just exclude them completely from your analysis if you're worried about it skewing your data too much. Because this is so dependent on context, usually this is where you would actually go and discuss with a team about what the right decision is if you're really not sure. For portfolio projects, go with the option that you think is most reasonable. You can use ChatGPT for a little bit of help here and just make sure that you actually document your thought process and record the severity 
of how many records this actually applied to. At the end of the step, you should be able to say something like 10% of delivery timestamps were missing and also 5% of the currency information was missing. However, these are not critical to this analysis. They were left as is. For the 3% of refund dates that showed up as being before the sales date, these were actually excluded from the analysis so as to not bias the data. So augmentation is a bit of a bonus and it just refers to making your data set more robust or flexible by adding more information to it, either by doing calculations between different columns or adding information from a separate data set. For example, in this case, you could have created a supplementary column that calculates the days that it took to actually ship something or the days between the shipment and the refund date. You could have also brought in extra information like the region because country codes is public information so you can always bring in more geographic detail here. What you have to ask yourself in this step is with more time and with more data, what would I actually like to have added to this analysis? And can I actually find those columns on my own, either by calculating them or bringing them in from an external source? At the end of this step, you should be able to say something like, I augmented the data set by adding in the time to deliver, the time to ship and the time to refund, as well as regional information so that we could better segment the sales and refunds trends and also understand the data at another geographic dimension. Some of the best data analysts I've worked with really stood out to me because they were really good at documentation. If you can show this skill in your portfolio project, you will stand out even more as an experienced analyst. If you've been noting your findings from the framework that I've been talking about, it'll be pretty easy for you to create a change log. Here's an example from one of my students who documented the issues that he found, the magnitude and the severity of the issues, as well as whether or not it was resolved. So that if any time he needed to explain his thought process to a hiring manager or even a stakeholder on the job, he could really Beasley back up the steps that he took to get to the initial data set and then his analysis. This also solidifies your own communication and thought process so that it gets easier for you to explain to someone else the steps that you took along the way. So in the end, the clean framework looks like this. Conceptualize and build your understanding of the data. Then locate and address the solvable issues in what Whatever technical tool you're using, documenting your steps along the way. Then you move on to the unsolvable issues where you make your best judgment call and make sure to also write down your reason or logic for going about it that way. Then you want to augment and improve the data set by adding in extra calculations and other dimensions that might be helpful in your analysis. And then at the end, you want to note and document the steps that you took, which includes the severity of the issue that you found, whether or not it was resolved and how you resolved them. In the end, our clean data set looks something like this. Numbers and dates have been formatted correctly correctly, the spelling has been consolidated for the different categorical dimensions, and then duplicates and nonsensical records have actually been removed because there was a pretty small percentage of them, and so it wasn't going to affect the analysis too much if we took them out. What I recommend you do is actually apply this framework to every new data set that you get so that you get more used to the cleaning process, and you actually start to build your intuition and your instinct for how to handle any new data set. At first, it might take you a long time, it's fine, it might take you a few hours or more at the beginning, and then over time as you get more comfortable, it'll It'll take you less time. In the interview process, you might actually get tested on this, where a hiring manager might ask you something like, how would you onboard yourself and clean and prepare a new data set? Or maybe you're going to get a take home test where you're actually asked to clean the data set and document your steps along the way. I will save all of that for a future video. In the meantime, let me know what you think about this video in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more insights and I will see you soon.